जमुन थिरा हैरान शाहियां जमुन थिरा हैरान शाहियां Hey, hey, hey,
और फिर मनंदे हरि हरि बो श्री प्रभु पान की जय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय दिस इज अ वर्स फ्रॉम द सेकंड चैप्टर Contents of the Gita summarize text number sixteen. Nasate vidyate nasato vidyate bhavo na bhavo vidyate sataha ubayor apidriston tas apidriston tas twaneyo statva darsha bhi. Nasato vidyate bhavo Nabavo vidyate sataha Ubayor apidristantas Twanayos tatva darsha bihi Chant? Those who are seers of the truth have concluded that of the non-existence, the material body, there is no duration, and of the eternal, there is no change, the soul. This they have concluded by studying the nature of both. Those who are seers of the truth have concluded of the non-existence, there is no duration, of the eternal, there is no change. This they have concluded by studying the nature of both. Mm-hmm. Purport, there is no endurance of the changing body, that the body is changing every moment by the actions and reactions of different cells as admitted by modern scientists. And thus growth and old age are taking place in the body. <clears throat> But the spirit soul exists permanently, remaining the same despite all changes of the body and the mind. That is the difference between matter and spirit. By nature, the body is ever-changing and the soul is eternal. This conclusion is established by all classes of seers of the truth, both impersonalists and personalists. In the Vishnu Purana 2.12.38, it is stated that Vishnu and his abodes are all self-illuminated spiritual existence. Jyoti Smi Vishnu Bhavani Vishnu <clears throat> The word existence and non-existence refer only to spirit and matter. That is the version of all seers of the truth. This is the beginning of the instructions by the Lord to the living entities who are bewildered by the influence of ignorance. Removal of ignorance involves the reestablishment of the eternal relationship between the worshiper and the worshipable and the consequent understanding of the difference between the part and parcel living entity and the supreme personality of Godhead. One can understand the nature of the supreme by thorough study of oneself. The difference between oneself and the supreme being understood as the relationship between the part and the whole. In the Vedic Sutras as well as in the Srimad Bhagavatam, the supreme has been accepted as the origin of all in emanations. Such emanations are experienced by superior and inferior natural sequences. The living entities belong to the superior nature, as will be revealed in the seventh chapter. Although there is no difference between the energy and the energetic, the energetic is accepted as the supreme, and the energy or nature is accepted as the subordinate. The living entities, therefore, are always subordinate to the Supreme Lord 
as in the case of the master and the servant or the teacher and the taught. Such clear knowledge is impossible to understand under the spell of ignorance. And to drive away such ignorance, the Lord teaches the Bhagavad Gita for the enlightenment of all living entities for all time. Omagyan timirandasya gena jana salakaya chaksun militam yena tasmai shri guruvena maha maum vishnu padaya krishna prasthaya bhutale shri makti bhakti vedanta swami tinamine namaste saraswati deve gaudavani pacharine nirvishesa sunyavari pastyatya de satarine shri krishna chaitanya prabhu nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar, Srivasati Gaur, Bhakta Vrindam, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hmm. So there are two energies, but they're divided into three categories. There is the permanent energy, which is the spiritual energy which is never created and always exists, never is, spiritual energy is never changed, it is always the same, it is always dynamic, and it is the force behind all of the existence. And then there is the inferior energy, which is coming from the same source as the spiritual energy, but it's made up of elements that are eternal, but how they formulate themselves is temporary. So, for example, Krishna says in the Gita, Bhumir apanalo bayu, kamana buddha evacha, hankar itya me bina prakriti astada. Earth, water, fire, air, air, ether, mind, intelligence, false ego. Make, make up my inferior energies. But in these inferior energies, when they formulate the different forms, that is the material existence. Ultimately, the basis of material existence is these five gross elements and three subtle elements. And they interact with each other to formulate forms in which we know as the material energy in terms of gross and subtle forms. Mm -hmm. Gross forms means what we can see, subtle forms means what we can perceive by action. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, the living entity is also an energy. This, the living entity is neither is spiritual, but has a tendency to become overwhelmed by an inferior energy called the material energy due to its association to the material energy. Just like a person who smokes cigarettes gets attached to the cigarette and becomes controlled by the cigarette, although the, the person is superior to this, to this cigarette and can reject it at any moment, but because there is a connection and that connection has caused an attachment, that sm smaller energy becomes the controller of something bigger. So we are controlled, the living entities in the material existence are controlled by Krishna's inferior energy called matter. Mm -hmm. So the material, the living entities are called tatasti, tatastu, or tatasta, I'm sorry, tatasta. Tatasta means, means marginal. Marginal means they have a tendency to to go either way, either towards the material or towards the spiritual. Although by nature they are spiritual, their tendency is in the material world to look towards the material, thinking they also are of the same nature. Just like the idea of death doesn't exist for the soul, but the living entity thinks that, that I die, but that is simply a feature of the material energy because everything in the material energy is temporary, because we have a temporary body, we identify with the body, therefore what happens to the body is happening to me. No. What's happening to the body, even death itself, doesn't happen to you. You're completely 
different and aloof from all those changes that happen by way of material energy. But because of the attachment, and the attachment brings about a, a kind of a misidentification. And based on a misidentification, we think we're something we're not. <laughs> And we th and we uh, we act in in a way that is contrary to our real nature. In other words, we try to enjoy something that is not enjoyable. And so this uh, these two energies, material and spiritual, are what we say um, all coming from the same source. And the living entities, here Prabhupada says, the living entities are like part of the whole. They're like, they're called parts and parcels. So the example would be like <clears throat> the fire. When you see a fire blazing, you see that our sparks are flying out of the fire. If the sparks stay in the fire, they also burn along with the fire. But when the spark flies out of the fire, it has little carbon existence and it falls somewhere else. It's fiery quality is extinguished. But if you take that same carbon particle and put it back in the fire, and it again lights up and, bright and is also fiery again. So in the same way, the living entities are by nature of the same quality of God, but somehow being attracted by the material energy, we leave the spiritual energy, and our spiritual quality gets it doesn't get extinguished, it just gets covered. It still remains. And again, when we come back into the spiritual energy, that quality again is re regenerated or re re uh, reunited. So these two energies, one is temporary, one is eternal. And therefore, uh, they don't mix. Just like the soul in the body, although the soul is so intimately connected with the body, the soul doesn't touch the body. Because matter and spirit cannot mix together. And just like if you take oil and water and you try to mix it, you'll find that the, uh, the oil and the water combination has a certain opposite nature and therefore it automatically separates without any outside influence. <clears throat> So that, that, that mixture is, is simply an idea or an illusion. We never touch the matter, although we are so con intimately connected with matter. And so that reconnection with the soul or with the supreme soul is by engaging the mind directly in the service of the Lord. The mind will bring the mind, the senses and the body and the intelligence in relationship to the Supreme Lord. And then the living entity again starts to experience its natural spiritual characteristics. And so, um, but matter, matter is jada. Jada means dead. It can't move. Matter only moves by the, the touch of spirit. Just like if you see a rock on the ground, it won't move. But if spirit touches it, even if the wind, the wind is moving, and through the wind, the action of the wind, the spiritual energy is working to move the wind, and the wind moves the rock. So the rock looks like it's moving by the force of the wind, but the wind is also being moved by the spiritual energy, and therefore everything is under the, what we say, uh, force of the spiritual energy. So this whole material world is simply a, a drab affair. Nothing is alive, but the presence of the spirit makes everything move, act, and interact. And we think, because we are moving this body, that the body is actually moving and acting and interacting, but it's not. It's the soul behind it, just like you see a puppet show. You can't see the puppeteer bouncing the puppet's He's somewhere hidden and behind the curtain. But the puppets are going this way and that way, and they're interacting, and people are watching the puppet show, and they're laughing, and they're having a good time watching it. And there's a whole interaction between the different puppets. But none of these puppets are alive. 
There's nothing happening really. It's just the man behind the scene is moving the puppets. And because we project a type of reality onto the movement, we, we, we identify that as, the, uh, as something that is actually, you know, happening. But what's happening is that there's a simple interaction with spirit and spirit using matter to connect w with each other. And this is how the material world goes on. <laughs> like that. So when two bodies somehow or other, two spirit souls come together, there's an interaction and everything moves by the, by the force of this. But behind the force of that, those living entities who are moving the material energy is a supreme mover who is moving everything, both the material and the living entities. And that is, of course, Krishna, the supreme source of everything. So even from a perspective of the spiritual, we can't do anything in relationship to matter unless we get the, uh, what we say, the power coming from the Lord. The Lord says, everything is happening by my arrangement, but the living entities are also moving under the influence of the arrangement of the Lord in connection with the material energy. So matter is dead <laughs> and spirit is alive. <laughs> Spirit is life. There is no such thing as matter being alive. It's just the movement of the uh, the movement of the matter by the interaction of the spiritual energy. That's all. So we have matter and spirit, and so the living entities belong to the superior energy and not the material energy, and therefore they have to find their existence in relationship to the spiritual if they're going to find any kind of satisfaction in life. In other words, as soon as they connect to the spiritual energy through through the activities of devotional service, they're actually starting, the soul is actually being stimulated by that larger energy, which is the source of them, the, the living entity, which is God himself. And so then, then life has meaning, it has purpose. Otherwise, this whole show is just like a show, that's all it is. It's like a dramatic performance. What you see is life is just one big drama. And just like in drama, there is the, there is the, uh, what, do they, what do they call it? Satire and what's the other side? The, huh? Comedy, a comedy is satire. Tragedy, yeah, tragedy and satire like that. So this is going on. It's a big show. Even one great uh, author, poet, philosopher, what was his name? Uh, I don't know, I slipped my mind. Shakespeare, famous Shakespeare. He said, the whole, the, all the world is a stage. <laughs> it's a big drama being played out. And the actual living beings are just playing with this material energy and moving this dramatic performance. And we think we're happy. We think we're sad. We think we're this. We think we're that. And it's, just, it's just a big, it's, it's a satire because it's a, it's, it's a joke. And it's a tragedy because <laughs> we think it's it's a, we think it's real and we, we try to get happiness out of this. So don't identify with the drama, just like you see a, drama, a dramatic performance on stage. And you know that behind the scenes there are actors who are playing the part of what is being played in front of them. The actors are not the, the parts that they're playing, they're just playing these parts. They are something different, they have their own private life. <laughs> Just like one famous playwright, John Barrymore, he would play the part in his own performances, and at the end he would int introduce himself as the, one of the players. But he was who he was. He was a director, but he played a part. So he's not one of the parts to the play. He's just directing himself in that part. So we're being directed to play different parts by the material energy. We're playing the part of a man, we're playing the part of a woman, playing the part of a, 
uh, a person of a particular con culture, country. We're playing different parts in relationship to this material energy. And, uh, mm, but it's all a show, it's just a drama. None of it's real. It's real in the sense that it's happening, but it's not. Re it's 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 unreal in the sense that it, it doesn't lead anywhere. It's simply the show goes on until the performance is over, and then then the living entity leaves that performance and gets another uh, part in the next play and plays another part, and then the drama continues, life after life. So this is uh, this is the material existence. It's just a big show, that's all it is. So we have to get out of the show because, you know, just like you go see a show, you you pay your money, you watch the show, you get some entertainment and you leave and you go on with your regular business. So our real business is to get out of the show by creating the proper consciousness to get out of there. And what is that consciousness? That my consciousness is that actually I, I have nothing to do with this material show. I'm, I belong in the spiritual world with Krishna. And there's a way to get back there. And there's a way to get back there. There's a direct way, and that is called pure devotional service. So when we start entering into that, then although we're doing the same thing that the show does, we're eating, we're driving, we're cleaning, we're cooking, we're doing various activities, we are not in the, we're in a real show now. This is the real performance because this world is a perverted reflection of the reality. What you see in this world goes on in the spiritual world. There are people, there are houses, there are conveyances, there are various types of, you know, there's birds, there's lakes, there's trees, there's, there's water. All this is in the spiritual world. The only difference is everything there is eternal everything is conscious and everything has a relationship directly in devotional service with the supreme lord who is the uh what we say the focus of all activities in the spiritual world here we are we focus on our own self and we focus on others in order to to satisfy ourselves here everyone is selfish the whole world is selfish everyone is thinking of their own self-interest and therefore, if they become a little bit charitable towards others, it's so they can further their own self-interest in, in, in a more kinder way. <laughs> so this, um, so the whole thing is a, uh, is just a reflection. But you can't, you can't change the, re you can't change the original. You can change the reflect, um, you can change the reflection. Just like you stand in front of the mirror, and when you see what you see in the mirror is what is outside, you can't you can't change the re, the actual image in the mirror without changing what's happening outside the mirror. So therefore, we we have in order to change our consciousness to the spiritual, we have to change. We can't change. The spiritual or we can't change the material we have to change ourselves and everything else changes and then the reflection actually becomes something different and then once we are pure then the reflection is no longer there what we see then is our true self which has nothing to do with this material existence <laughs> so therefore when you understand everything you understand yeah, you're here, and but don't but don't be here. Be in the spiritual energy, and live your life in such a way as you take care of business here, and then go get out and go back home, back to Godhead, where life is real. There's no reality here. It's real in the sense that it's happening, but it's unreal in the sense that it's temporary and it's full of misery. We want to be. We want to live forever. We can't live forever here. We want to have all knowledge. We're always overcome by ignorance. We want to have. Well, we want to be happy all the time, or we find ourselves struggling to get a little bit of satisfaction. So that's the difference. But in the spiritual world, everything is natural. We live eternally there. Knowledge is complete and perfect, 
and joyfulness is the natural nature of each of all the living entities in the spiritual world. They're always joyful, blissful. So, yeah, there's a big difference between material and spiritual. And one is that uh, we are eternal and this material world is temporary. We can't make any deal with the temporary. We have to get out of the temporary and back to the eternal. <laughs> what is that verse? Oh, yeah, I see. Uh, Maya Andakar, no, what is it? Krishna, Krishna Suya Sama Maya Andakar. Krishna Suri, Krishna's light, Maya is darkness. Get out of the darkness, come back to the light. And this world is dark too. There's no light here. Is there any light here? No. It's completely dark and cold. Nothing can live here. What gives it light is the sun. So you might say we have electricity, but electricity is, electricity is coming from the power of the atmosphere. So it's coming from the outside also. So this place is cold and dark. It's dead. We can only live here because of the sun and because of the sun's energies. That's all. As soon as you take the sun away, everything is finished. <laughs> sun is what? 93 million miles away from us. So we supply, life is supplied by us from a, from a planet 93 million miles away. And we think, oh, we're okay here. It's just, <laughs> we're dancing in the darkness, that's all. Okay, so, you know, don't stick around. Chant the holy names with great attention, with, with complete devotion. Um, don't waste your time trying to make an arrangement in this material world to be happy here. Every material arrangement you do is just a waste of time because there was one story, Prabhupada tells the story of Lomasa Muni. One Lomasa Muni, he, had, he was a sage, and he was a very hairy sage. He had a lot of hair. And he had a benediction that he could live for one day of Lord Brahma for every hair on his body. So you know, Prabhupada said he, he had an unbelievable long lifetime. So he had some followers. He was living on the banks of the Holy River and doing his bhaja. So his father's followers were concerned that their guru didn't have any place. So they said to them, him, can we build you a, a place to stay and live? He said, don't bother. I'm not going to be here so long. <laughs> So he, he understood that, you know, even though there is apparently long in relationship to material, it's still going to end sometime. It's temporary. So we don't like anything tem temporary that gives us happiness. We want eternal happiness. We don't like any. The only good thing about this world is that the misery is also temporary. <laughs> Unless you continue to stay here life after life, and then you extend that misery continuously. But even in misery, it's temporary. So everything in this world uh, has a beginning and an end. <laughs> okay, thank you. Any questions or comments? Hmm. Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj, thank you for the lecture. Um, my question is, you mentioned that in the spiritual world everything is conscious. Um, and I heard it several times said that this material world, the material energy is also made out of consciousness, but that it is covered, it's dull. No. Spirit is consciousness because it interacts with matter. That's the consciousness. Matter, matter has no consciousness. Matter is jada. It's dead. Just like, you know, 
you got this piece of wood here. So this piece of wood was part of a tree one time. So when it was part of the tree, it had it had it was growing. But now since it's cut off from the tree, which is a, li a life living being, it's dead. There's no life to it. So as soon as the matter gets taken away from spirit, it's formed into something like houses or cars or computers or any furniture or anything. It's uh, no longer moving. It's more or less, it's only moves, but when a living, when a human being or some living entity takes it and pushes it this way or moves it that way. Matter is jada. It is simply inanimate. It's only moved by spirit. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Thank you for your lecture, Your Holiness. I need, uh, I can't make by myself a definition for something what was very obvious right now while you was explaining our material nature. The heart beats and it beats in a, in a good, in, a, uh, in the mode of goodness. It keeps every organ and everything alive in us. So a vibration keeps everything in us alive. So a vibration is a sign for us, inside of us, that uh, a constant vibration is something what has effort for everything, yeah, for the but, whole. But that's so a machine. How can we, how can we with, this, with this example, how can we encourage people to understand that uh, using our tongue as an external, as a, as, a, as a tool also with the heartbeat, so it has a little bit more bass, so the instruments together work, uh, so the chanting is attractive and it makes sense. How can we give a good definition? Because it makes sense that to use our tongue to vibrate more than just to listen to our heart, how it beats. Yeah, well, the heart is beating because it's pumping blood. It's a machine. The tongue is moving because it has desire to taste and a desire to speak. So what's moving all these things is the soul. So when you're chanting the holy names of the Lord, you're using the tongue and, of course, the ear to hear. So you can connect that sound back to the, the source, which is Krishna. So uh, the more you put your energy and consciousness into it, the more effective it, it will have in connecting you. Consciousness has to be in the right mood. So when you're chanting, you have to be chanting in the mood of reaching out to Krishna, calling out for Krishna, praying to Krishna to, to um, come in the form of his holy name and purify your existence, to pick you up and put you at his lotus feet. So the body can also be a source of, you know, can help us or can take us away if the body is giving us trouble. And then when we try to chant, we get diverted, or our attention gets diverted away. If the body is healthy, good, then it can help us focus more, and we can devote more energy into the chanting. So keep good health, so your heart is beating nicely. <laughs> and uh, eat nice Krishna prasadam, so the tongue feels happy. And then when you chant, you'll be more likely to chant nicely. Yes. Mm -hmm. We have a question by Shri Devi Dasi. Uh, but can we not be happy even while in this material world by being absorbed in devotional service. Then you're not in the material world anymore. You're in the spiritual atmosphere. So your body may be in the material world, but your consciousness is. You are where your mind is. You're sitting here, we're sitting here talking, but if our mind is like in India now and we're on a holy pilgrimage, that's where we are. 
So you can bring your mind to where you are, or you can your mind can take you somewhere else, anywhere in this existence. And then that's where you are. You are where your mind is, wherever it takes you. So, yeah, the speed of the mind is the fastest speed in existence materially. It's faster than the speed of light. It's faster than the speed of sound. Speed of light is 186,000 miles per second. Speed of light. Speed of sound is even, I think, faster than that. The speed of mind is so fast that it can't even be calculated. Just imagine you're sitting here, just think of something in India, and you're there. So you just traveled how many thousands of miles in less than a second? So bring your mind into Krishna, and Krishna is, he's not part of this material energy, and you create the spiritual atmosphere within the material existence by devotional service. I mean, Christ said something really nice, Jesus, Lord Jesus Christ, he said, be in the world, but not of the world. You see, even just like there was one very powerful Russian uh, leader. His name was uh, Stalin. He had such a powerful mind. They were going to do an operation on his body. And they were going to give him an anesthesia. I think that's something. They were going to do some operation on his stomach. He said, no, I want to watch the operation. So he had the power of mind where he could actually, you know, transcend pain like that. It was like that. So there are, there are people who, they can take their mind away from the present situation and bring their mind into someplace else. And therefore they're not experiencing anything that's going on in the immediate place. Their consciousness is somewhere else. So when we actually enter into the spiritual, we actually take our consciousness, you know, away from this body. And we're now with Krishna. We're now absorbed in Krishna's holy name or hearing Krishna's pastimes. We're absorbed in Krishna's service. We're not in the spiritual, we're not in a material world anymore. The material world is a state of consciousness. Yes. Hi, Krishna. Well, uh, uh, as far as I could understand, whatever we think of, we go to that place. Mm -hmm then why we cannot um, enter into spiritual world factually? Through the power of thinking? Yeah, because... You, you know, can, uh, but you can't stay there because you're not pure enough. You can, by the projection of the mind, you can actually take yourself to the gates of the spiritual world. That's what Dharasa Muni did. He actually took his body to various places in the higher realms and he went all the way up to the Vaikuntha level by the power of the mind. I mean, the mind can, there's a certain level of the mind called mystic power where you can transcend the ordinary. You're still in the material, but it's a higher form of material energy. 
you can do that. You can take yourself into the mystical energy, you're into your mystical mindset and project yourself all the way up to the spiritual world. But because your soul is not fully purified yet, you can't stay there. <laughs> Yogis can do that. They can do, they can project themselves pretty much anywhere in creation. And they can even go higher above the creation into, you know, Lord Shiva's abode, which is outside the material existence. They can even go up to the, they can even go up to the, to the border of Vaikuntha, but they can't enter because they're not pure enough. By the power of mystic yoga, yeah. We see people even in the material world, they can, uh, they, the power of mind over matter. You know, people walk on hot coals and their feet don't even get burnt. <laughs> By power of mind over matter. Prabhupada said, you can fly. Each of us have the ability to fly. You just have to learn how to do it. You can fly just like the birds. Mystic yogis do that. <laughs> Power of the mind. The yogis can do that. And yogis, when there was one magician, he, they lock him in the box, and they put him in a box, they lock him, they tie chains around the box, they throw the box in the ocean. And he gets out. Anima, Lagima, prapti. Prapti means you can get anything from any part of the creation simply by thinking of it. Oh, you know there's a fruit tree in maybe a thousand miles away from here. You've seen a fruit tree somewhere and you meditate on that fruit tree. You can bring the trees, that fruit to where you are. Power of the mind. This is all mystic yoga. Many yogis can do that. No. But the thing is, you can't enter into the spiritual realm simply by mystic yoga. Mm -hmm. You can get close, but you can't enter because in, in the spiritual realm is only for those who are purified. Mm -hmm. Does that help? Mm -hmm. Your Holiness, we had this question from uh, Milan. I don't remember his last name, but he was asking about the spiritual television. Um, if we have signs of this spiritual television, does that mean that we are actually have entered the spiritual realm? Because he was asking, what does that mean, the spiritual television? So if it's, we, it's, it's mystic, just like Sanjay. Sanjay was sitting with Dhritarashtra in his own place, but he could see what was happening on the battlefield of Kurukshetra. He was projecting because in his own mind and heart, he could visualize the actual scene on the battlefield. And he was reporting everything that was going on to Dhritarashtra. So in the same way, it's not spiritual television, it's, it's mystic yoga, that's all. It's, it's mystic, very powerful. Spiritual television is something like, I don't know if there's such a thing called spiritual television, but if somehow Krishna uh, allows, he can open up the, your ability to enter into the, the consciousness of the spiritual realm as an experience, but you still you can't say that. Just like I'll give you an example. Many souls who are in the womb who have been pious in their last life, they're about to take birth again. On their seventh month, Krishna cuts away all the maya, and they can see themselves as a spirit soul. They can see Krishna as their supreme master and lovable object. All the, all the illusion is cut away for this little tiny baby who's not even born yet. 
the baby prays at that time that when I get out, then I'll become your devotee. So that's there for not for all children in the womb, but for those who are very pious, the Lord allows that to happen so they can not waste their time when they get out and, and just engage in devotional service. So to enter into the spiritual television has to come from the spiritual realm, not from you can't do it by your own power. Mystic yoga can take you to different realms of existence and different consciousness, but it can't bring you into the spiritual realm. I mean, Krishna, can, Krishna appears into your dream sometimes, a spiritual master appears into your dream. The spiritual energy is coming. And you're seeing the spiritual master, you're seeing Krishna. You may even see what's going on in the spiritual world. But it's all coming by the grace of the Lord. That's all. If the Lord wants to show you some mercy, he can appear like that. And show you a little bit about the spiritual world through dreams. Or... Just like there's one, there's one book, Simple for the Simple. It's a little book. It's about one of my god sisters who was living in, uh, what's that place, Scotland. And uh, she was uh, she was leaving her body. She spent most of her life serving the devotees very nicely. And while she was leaving, before she was leaving, she was entering into her spiritual existence while she was still in this body. And she was saying, "I'm with Mother Yasoda, and I'm helping Mother Yasoda um, get food for Krishna, like that." So she was seeing herself in the spiritual world. This was actually a real experience. Devotees would ask her questions about what she was seeing. And she would say, no, it's not like that. It's like this. She was still able to speak. So Krishna gave her some special mercy even before she went back to the spiritual world. He was revealing it to her in her consciousness prior to her departure from this world. <laughs> so that comes by the grace of the Lord. <laughs> But mystic power, you can develop that. And then you can be like Sanjay. You can be here and you can see what's going on in Split. <laughs> or Dubrovnik. Or, or Sarajevo. Or, uh, you know, Belgrade. <laughs> yeah, you can... If you do, you can do, you can develop it, but don't waste your time. It's just this is his mystic power is just a waste of time. Just like there was one man, he had spent his eighteen years studying mystic power. He left his village, came back after eighteen years, and everybody was happy to see him back. He said, "He said I can walk across this water," and so he walked across the water. Everybody think, oh, wow, now he can walk on the water all the way across. But one man in the village, he was a little smart. He says, I can take a boat across for a couple of rupees. And he spent 18 years figuring out how to walk across water. <laughs> Just pay two rupees and you're, you're across. <laughs> Yeah, so mystic power, you can develop that if you work on it. Krishna explains mystic power in the Srimad Bhagavatam in two full chapters. But then at the end, he says, it's a waste of time <laughs> after explaining the whole thing. <laughs> Better to just get out of this material world and go back to spiritual world then you have not only mystic power you have spiritual vision and you have spiritual consciousness mm -hmm. 
Anything else? <laughs> That's it. Okay. Thank you very much. Shila Prabhupada Ki Jai. <laughs>